majority of people still believe that that is the end of who we are. People with a death experience also, also call it uh, an experience of oneness because they are connected with everything and everybody. They know what other people think, they know what other people feel. They know that someone will die in three weeks and they will die. Now as a young doctor I was convinced that death was the end of everything. And now I'm convinced that death is not the end. There's no beginning, nor will there ever be an end to consciousness. Consciousness is before birth and after death. There's a continuity of consciousness. The essence of who we are will never end. Death is not the end of who we are. And when we leave our body, we come into a dimension where it's all about unconditional love and compassion. That's what I've learned. Hey there, Inspired Spirits. At the time of this recording, only 94% of you that are actually returning to watch a second or a third or a fourth video here on the Inspired Evolution podcast are actually subscribed. I can't tell you how much it genuinely helps everything we're trying to achieve with promoting positivity in the world through your subscription. Every time you hit subscribe, it helps us grow the platform. It lets guests that want to come onto the show know that you know it is worth their time to take the time out to carve out a conversation like the ones that you're enjoying here on the Inspired Evolution podcast. My personal commitment to you is as the show grows, you know, more and more quality, more and more conversations, richer and richer things will flow around here. That is my absolute commitment to you, to be completely transparent as we grow. And when we finally get to that 100,000 subscriber mark, currently we do two episodes a week. I'm looking forward to getting us to about three episodes a week so we can really keep the juju going and flowing at an even greater level. And all of that is enabled by you taking the time to hit subscribe, hit that bell notification. So if you can, Please take a moment, take a moment, come on, take one sec, quick sec, <laughs> hit subscribe and hit that bell notification icon. It helps so much more than I can say. Thank you so much. Yo! Welcome back to the Inspired Evolution. And we have with us today, Inspiring Our Evolution, Pim Van Lommel. How are you there, Pim? I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> It is such a pleasure to have Dr. Pim with us here today. In order to do the honours, I don't even know really where to begin. We've got a distinguished cardiologist in you. Um, you're a global speaker. You've shared your groundbreaking insights from your own personal re research on near-death experiences on which you've become an authority now. You've spent 37 years researching, a lot of it just on your own dime, on your own accord, just through your own passions and interests. Um, the research has been hailed as groundbreaking. It's challenged a lot of conventional views on consciousness. Um, you wrote Consciousness Beyond Life, which is an acclaimed book. Um, yeah, you're an influential vo voice in this space and you've been trailblazing the space of near-death experiences, what it teaches us about consciousness and the nature of our consciousness since 19, is it 87, 88? It's, <laughs> am I getting it right? Is it too far ago for you to even remember, Pim? It just is your life now, I imagine. <laughs> How old are you? <laughs> How old am I? Oh, no. Now you're going to judge me. Um, I am 35 this year. So I was born in 1988. So I'm 35. So, so, so you've been... That's, that's, why, that's why I ask it. <laughs> yeah. I was you've already been... studying the analysis before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's ask that question because, you know, it's... <laughs> You're an eminent cardiologist. You were a cardiologist for 26 years. Um, and midway through your like through practicing you've all of a sudden how does a cardiologist become fascinated by near-death experiences like what what happened there like yeah well as a cardiologist you have the privilege to meet patients who survive a cardiac arrest so uh, the first time i ever heard about a near death experience was in 1969 I was working, uh, starting my rotating internship for specialisa specialization in cardiology. And I was working one of the first coronary care units in Holland. Uh, before 1967, all patients died by cardiac arrest because 
modern CPR, modern cardiopulmonary resuscitation was not possible. So the uh, defibrillation and external chest compression were just starting in 1969. So we had a patient who, who got a cardiac arrest and we resuscitated him with several shocks. And after about four minutes, he regained consciousness. And we were so happy as resuscitation, resuscitation team. I was the doctor in charge. We were so happy that the patient was so, so extremely disappointed that he was back. And he told about going through a tunnel, talk about music, about beautiful landscape. About So uh, there was not nothing well known about near-death experience. The, the terminology near-death experience only came out in 1975 by the book by John, uh, uh, Raymond Moody, Life After Life. So, and I was just busy with a young family, young children, just starting species eight. So I did never forget it, but never did anything with it until I read the book by George Ritchie, Return from Tomorrow in 1986. I read his book and where he describes where he died as a medical student in 1943 by double pneumonia and he didn't get antibiotics. They were not available for a student. So he died, was declared dead, and was, his body was covered with a sheet. And the nurse was so upset that this young medical student died that he was able to persuade the doctor to give him an injection of adrenaline right into his heart, which was quite uncommon. So he regained consciousness after nine minutes of being dead, and he had a very, very deep and impressive near death experience, out of body experience, well, all aspects you can imagine. And I was so intrigued by this book that I just started in 1986 to ask patients who survived the cardiac arrest in the past if they could remember something from the period of unconsciousness from the period of cardiac arrest and to my surprise within two years asking 50 patients 12 of them shared the NDE with me. So then it started my scientific curiosity because I have always learned in university and school as you have done as well that consciousness is just a product of brain function. So it should be impossible to have memories from periods of unconsciousness. You should let alone have an enhanced consciousness with the possibility of perception out and above the lifeless body and see deceased relatives, life review, etc. So that's so it started for me with scientific curiosity. Mm. And yeah, I, I totally wholeheartedly connect to the idea that we associate consciousness and emanating from the mind. The the tagline for the inspired evolution has been um, expand your consciousness and the logo is the brain. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, I'm here to be educated by you today for sure. Because yeah, what did, um what was some of the contents of, because being absent for nine minutes is quite an extended period of time to be away for. Um, what were some of the, what were some of the insights from, or the descriptions that allured you from that um, f what must have been a fascinating story. Well, he had, let's say, all the main elements, usual elements you can hear from patients who had a near-death experience. So the near-death experience is the reported memory of, of a period of, of a special state of consciousness with universal elements. The first is uh, be aware of being dead and then have the possibility to have perception out and above the lifeless body. So perceiving your own resuscitation, your own CPR, or your own surgery from a position out and above your lifeless body. Then you can come into a dark room, which can be frightening as well. And then you see a small light where you're attracted to, which they call a, a tunnel. And then they come into an otherworldly dimension with a feat of unconditional love and acceptance. And then they can meet he sees relatives. He can meet a being of light, and usually with the being of light, they have a life review. They relive their whole life from early childhood, from birth. Sometimes they have a, a preview. See, they see future events uh, from their own life. And then they can come to a border and they hear a voice. It's not your time yet. They have still a task to fulfill, and then they have a conscious return back into the body, which is awful for them. So these are the elements that George Ritchie described them all. 
it's really interesting because you could easily put it down to delusion, could you not, if it wasn't um, a repeated scenario? Well, it's not a delusion because it really happens because especially we know by the out-of-body experience that what people can perceive, you can corroborate is radical perceptions. You can ask doctors and nurses or family members about what really happened at the same moment and what time it happened. And then you can prove that this out-of-body experience happened during the period of cardiac arrest. So it's a reality. It's not a delusion. It's more a hallucination, not an illusion. And moreover, you need a functioning brain to have a delusion or illusion or hallucination. And the brain doesn't function at all anymore when you have cardiac arrest, when you're clinical death. Yeah, that is so fascinating, right? Because in order to have a hallucination, you need a functioning brain. And a hallucination is generally about seeing something that isn't there. But this is almost the inverse of that, which is the brain is not there. And yet reality is being perceived. This is quite mystical. Well, that, that's what I just, I wanted to know if there could be an explana a scientific explanation about the cause and content of an LE. That's why we started in 1988 a prospective study of 344 consecutive survivors of cardiac arrest in 10 days hospitals to see if we could find an answer to these questions. And uh, this prospective study took another four years. And then we had a longitudinal study with taped interviews two years and eight years, but all survivors of cardiac arrest with an NEM and, 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 and a mesh control group of patients who survived the cardiac arrest, mesh control with the same age, the same time interval in the same gender to see if the transformation you hear is the result of the ND or the result of the cardiac arrest and that has never been studied before in a longitudinal design. So the first thing they, about the prospective study, 18% of the patients, 62 patients reported a classical near-death experience. And when we compare the 82% of patients without any ND with the 18% of the patients who had an NDE, there was no difference at all. Let's say in the duration of cardiac arrest, if it was three minutes or eight minutes, did it matter at all? If they had a period of unconsciousness of five minutes of three weeks in coma, did it matter at all? If they have a complicated CPR with the need of um, uh, intubation and a lot of medication, did it matter at all? The 30 patients with electrophysiological stimulation in the cath lab where there is an induced cardiac arrest, the patients are resuscitated within 20 to 30 seconds. Did not matter at all? So the severity of lack of oxygen in the brain, the anoxia, was not important at all. So all patients in our study had been unconscious due to anoxia of the brain, and only 80% had a near death experience. So we could exclude for, uh, differently that anoxia a lack of oxygen in the brain could not be an explanation for the cause of an NDE. And it was the same for uh, psychological explanation. Let's say fear of death was not an explanation at all. The use of medication didn't matter at all. Foreknowledge, that you know that this ex experience is impossible, did not matter at all. Uh, religion, if they were Christian or atheist or Muslim, did not matter at all. Education, gender, did not matter at all. So the main conclusion of this study, the, still the largest study ever done on the death experience, and the only study with statistical analysis, is that there is no scientific or medical explanation why people have a near-death experience. And we could exclude all explanations like what you said, hallucinations, delusions, uh, um, false memories, um, lack of oxygen in the brain, uh, neurotransmitters, etc. And the second part of the study, the Logodula study, that we looked at the classical transformation where these people have no fear of death anymore. They have a new insight what is important in life. And that it means empathy and unconditional love towards yourself, accept your negative aspects we all have, and also feeling connected with other people. And the third aspect is enhanced intuitive sensitivity. And we found in this longitudinal study that only patients with any death experience had this classical transformation. 
which means that it is the objective proof of the subjective experience because you cannot prove scientifically a subjective experience but you can prove the transformation as well so and which study was published in the lancet in 2001 and it became a worldwide stir <laughs> yeah, the, the subjective experiences are actually quite profound i don't know if they use the word quiet and that seems like a, a caveat they are profound um yeah, fear of death is such a phenomenal fear that for most of humanity, um, yeah, and the like. I want to talk to you about the enhanced intuitive sens sensitivity and the compassion. But one of the questions that then does naturally lend itself: if there was no scientific um, uncoverings in terms of why the NDEs were happening, do you have your own sort of? These people were destined for this transformation like they were yeah do you understand the nature of my question was it always meant to be for these people this way this was no, part I, of their life path or it's hard to probably I say believe, right i don't believe so so there have been other studies now that say there's one prospective study in children in the age of five children who died because of or nearly died because of nearly drowning or uh, uh, coma traffic accidents uh, Myelinitis, etc., and in this small study, seventy percent of the children had a near-death experience. Where you had retrospective studies in patients between thirty and forty years old, usually traffic accidents, you find about thirty percent of people have a near-death experience. And in our study, with the mean age of sixty-two years, only eighty percent had a near-death experience. And where we look just for the patients under the age of sixty there were more near death experience than the older group of our uh, patients. And patients who had the near death experience in the, in the past had more frequently an ND as an adult in cardiac arrest. So there are far more arguments that you can tell. It's not just you are able to. But for my opinion is that when you're a young child, you're open, always open, under the age of five, six years old, you're always connected with this enlarged or enhanced consciousness as a child. And then you lose this connection. And the older you are, the more fixed your this connection is. So you need more time to get out of your body. And we have a cardiac arrest and CPR has to be done with between five to 10 minutes because otherwise you will die. Clinical death is the first stage of dying. And I think at, at older age, people need more time to get out of their body. Everybody will have a death experience, but perhaps they need 30 minutes before they get out of their body. So everybody who dies will have a death experience, but a near-death experience at older age, when there is a CPR, not everybody is fit to get out of the body within five to 10 minutes. That's my explanation. Yeah, wow, that's fascinating. There are distinct stages to death, or is it different for everybody? Like, you know, in the first few seconds, the first few minutes, the first few hours? Do you, does science look at it that way? Well, there is no time during this experience. So, um, the kind of exp the consciousness you experience during an NDE is beyond time and beyond space. Like, let's say, when you have the life review, where you think of each moment in the past you will be there when you think of a person you will meet him so everything happens at the same time and we have a kind of rest of three minutes you can talk for a week what happens because everything is there instantaneously beyond time and beyond space so it's a different kind of consciousness as we have here in our waking consciousness yeah that's fascinating and the definition of a uh, near-death experience, is this based on all of the symptoms that you described earlier, the um, the being aware of that we're dead, uh, having the out-of-body experience, witnessing the small light, uh, meeting others in an otherly dimension, knowing that it's not time to return, but being told to do so and being gravely upset about that? I want to talk about the upset bit, <laughs> but is this, the, is this the symptomology of what defines a near-death experience? Yes, this, these are all the possible elements people can experience, but not all patients have all these elements. The more elements that are experienced, the deeper the NDE is, is, is diagnosed. 
but uh, some people have only two or three elements, but it's still a near-death experience. And so what we did is sitting patient with a cardiac arrest, clinical death, but also, let's say, we have a lot of loss of blood in complicated childbirth. Young women will have can have near-death experience or coma due to traffic accidents or uh, hemor brain hemorrhage can have near-death experiences. Uh, children with near drowning. But any like experiences also happens in fear death experience that you have a near um, traffic accident or mountaineering accidents. You can have it in a terminal stage of, of illness, that's uh, end of life experiences. You can have it a meditation or depression, existential crisis or isolation or just walk in nature. So there are many possibilities to have this kind of experiences. But for a scientific point of view, it was important to study patients with a cardiac arrest because we know these patients have no brain function left at all. But the fact that other circumstances these experiences can be experienced, like a meditation, this also proves that there is an oxygen of the brain, lack of oxygen, cannot be an explanation at all. Mm. How did... Yeah, so this opens up a very grand mystery a little bit, and maybe you can help us demystify it a little bit. Um, that our consciousness then, because in a cardiac arrest, your brain is it's off, it's gone, it's not present, um, and yet we are somewhere, and by we I mean our consciousness is somewhere, and then it returns, and in many instances it can recount what was happening while the brain was off. Um, it opens up a whole portal of extrasensory perception, but it also opens up the conversation primarily. If consciousness is not linked to the brain, do we have any uh, sort of conjectures on where consciousness may be housed? What? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's trippy. Yeah. Well, that's the main question, you know, well, first of all, how do we know that the brain does not function anymore during cardiac arrest? Mm. This is an Let's important start question. Let's start there. And, mm. and so when you have the clinical side where you, there have been studies done that induced cardiac arrest, let's say, for patients to threshold testing in ICDs, internal defibrillators, and also in animal models there have been induced cardiac arrest. And these studies have been done with the registration of the EEG, that is the registration of electrical activity of the cortex of the brain. Well, the clinical sciences where you have an induced cardiac arrest, you lose consciousness within seconds. The blood flow of the brain here you can measure on the carotid artery is zero within one second. The body reflexes are gone, which is a function of the cortex, so the body doesn't do anything anymore. And the brain stem reflexes are gone, the gag reflex, you can put a finger in someone's throat. The corneal reflexes and fixed dilated pupils are clinical findings. And the people don't breathe anymore. The breathing center is closer to the brain stem. So the clinical fight is that there's no function of the brain left. And when you have the EEG, you see a flatline EEG within 10 to 20 seconds. So you measure no activity anymore of the, of the brain. And where you need a resuscitation with CPR, it's never successful within 20 seconds. It always takes several minutes whether it is in a cardio, somewhere in a ward, the hospital takes much more time, and an out of hospital arrest is even takes much more time. So, an out of hospital arrest, only ten percent of the patient will survive because there is a period of five to ten minutes that you have to start CPR. If you are too late, brain stems are irreversible damage, and the patient will die. So now we know for sure that the brain does not function at all, and that still people can have this enhanced consciousness. So how can we explain this? And, and um, the kind of consciousness people share with you is that this consciousness is without, beyond time and beyond space. It's this instantaneous connected with everything, with everybody. If the past and the future is available at the same moment. So based on the scientific research, based on studies on the death experience, and an analogy with quantum physics, I call this non-locality. And non-locality is that it is beyond time and beyond space and instantaneously interconnected. So 
consciousness is always there beyond time, beyond space, inside and outside our body. It's always there. And when you are awake, that the brain just functions as an interface or filter to receive a small part of this enhanced consciousness, a small, a small part of memories into your waking consciousness. But when the brain doesn't function anymore, you're in this enhanced consciousness and everything is available as well. So it's always there, but when you're awake, you just receive a small part of this enhanced or more local consciousness. So the question also is, where are you when you are asleep? Where is your consciousness? It's there. And if your brain is functioning, but there is no interconnection between different parts of the brain. And this is the same for general anesthesia. But people can have this enhanced consciousness during general anesthesia. You can have it during coma. You can have it during cardiac arrest. And to understand this kind of non-local consciousness are compared with the worldwide communication. At this very moment, where you are sitting there, there are hundreds of thousands of telephone calls going through your room and going through you. And there are hundreds of television and radio programs going through you. And there are a billion of websites and YouTube films are in your room, in your house, and go through your body at the same time. So it's uh, because you need a functional instrument to receive this electromagnetic informational field. So you have to put on your telephone or your radio or your laptop computer. And they, Wherever you are in the world, you can receive this, this, the iCloud, the build your websites and YouTube films. But it is not produced by your computer, it is received by you. And so it's the same with the brain. You can compare the non local consciousness with the iCloud, it's always everywhere. But you need a functioning brain to receive parts of it. But when the brain doesn't function, it's always there. That is a beautiful analogy, and it alludes very much to a spiritual concept of oneness, um, which a lot of people who I've found through your research report when they come back, this interconnectedness. It, yeah, still makes me wonder just a little bit, and I'd love to get clarity on it, is, you know, while the brain is active, is at that point consciousness somewhat connected to the brain? And then when we sleep, it returns back to the cloud? Um, and, you know, or is it actually, we're always operating out of the cloud and it just happens to be that we're aware of processing data from the cloud and it just is a complete myth of dogma <laughs> that consciousness is in the mind. Um, yeah. Do you understand the nature of my question? I'm trying to describe something and I think I'm doing it poorly. Well, <laughs> we have always the possibility of access to this local consciousness, but usually we don't have it. When you dream, yes, sometimes you have aspects of this non-local consciousness. You can have prognostic dreams. So then they have a view of the future. So then you're in this kind of an aspect of non-local consciousness as well. But um, you need, again, you need to function the functioning brain. And the brain is just a filter for aspects of this non-local consciousness. And about the interconnectedness, people with the death experience, also, also call it uh, an experience of oneness because they are connected with everything and everybody. And when they are back, one of the aspects of transformation is the enhanced intuitive sensitivity, which means that they are connected with other people. They know what other people think. They know what other people feel. They know that someone will die in three weeks and they will die. They are connected with, with animals, with plants. They are connected with the planet Earth. So they are one with others. So, to understand it, normally you receive channel one, your own consciousness, but when you had an adaptive experience, you receive channel two, three, four, and five of consciousness of other people as well. So your threshold of consciousness has permanently changed. So you're more able to have access with aspects of non-local consciousness of other people as well. Sounds like somewhat of an enlightened state to be in, right? Because you're actually more, you, it's because when I imagine what enlightenment is, it's more, you, you're not even more compassionate. You actually see the other as yourself in many ways. Exactly. Um, and that's what I'm hearing as you're describing it. Yes. 
you work with others. <laughs> you connect. That's fascinating. <laughs> connect with nature. So you you take you, so so far more. They change the way they live. They be vegetarian. They don't want to be animals killed for eating. The environmental discussion is so important for them as well. So we have to keep the planet safe for our children and grandchildren to survive. So the, the way they live changes. It's not about power. It's not about money. It's not about a beautiful young body. It's not about clothes. It's not about a big car. It's about compassion and empathy towards others, towards yourself to start with, but to then towards others and to try to save the world, to save other people as well. Have you witnessed in any of the um, people that you've worked with through your research some complications with the enhanced intuitive sensitivity? Like It must be not the easiest um, piece of awareness to integrate, I imagine, as you've come from living life a certain way, like tuning into one channel and then now you've got multiple channels open. <laughs> yeah. Well, I always say that, that the content of an ND is usually positive when we're coming back in this world, and you, when you try to share your ND with others, nobody will listen. Doctors don't listen, nurses don't listen, family members, partner. There's a divorce rate of 70% because they say it's not the same person I, I was married before. So you change totally, and you even don't know that there have been other people's people who have this kind of experience, you think you're crazy because your world view has changed as well. So having an NDE is a spiritual trauma with years of depression, years of home homesickness, years of loneliness before they are able to share it with others. When they find someone who can listen without any comment and prejudice and then read a book or see a film on television, then they know I'm not alone, I'm not crazy. And then they start to accept this experience. And then the second thing is to integrate this experience into their daily life. And it will take 10, 20, 30, 40 years to integrate this experience because it's so hard to change the way you live. And I have, we had done once a study in 82 patients who had an NDE in the past with a mean interval of 24 years between seven months and 70 years. And at the mean interval of 24 years, still half of those patients were not, have not been able to share the NDE with others. They were still silent. I've met people who have been silent for 50 years because they were not able to share it with others. So it's a trauma. It's really, it's really, ha it's hard to have this enhanced sensitivity. It's hard to have this different worldview. I will say as a joke, when in the Western world, it's a trauma. When, when you have it in India, you have congratula congratulations because people know that it is possible. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a materialist. As an Indian, I can probably it's attest to that. It's, it's like, yes. Yeah. It's like, congratulations. <laughs> yes. When you, uh... when you explain it to Aboriginals, Aboriginals don't need a mobile telephone. They can communicate at long distances. Mm. Just from consciousness to consciousness. Messages so the wind. indigenous yeah. people have this knowledge and have these possibilities as well. Mm, profound. Yeah. The um the fear of death and people being upset of coming back is um uh, is it inspiring? I don't know how to use the right word. This such an interesting territory to be having a conversation around. Um, but yeah, the fact that people are upset that they come back is quite interesting when so many of us mere mortals, I'm just going to call us that, um, have such a fear of death and those that potentially have crossed over and do come back have this interesting relationship with, oh, I'm sad that I'm back. Um it's weird using the word inspiring, but it um, there's a healing that's available. Let's use that as a word um, for what we judge um, death to be as a mainstream perspective. Your thoughts on that? Well, the majority of people still believe that death is the end of who we are. So that's the fear of death. They think it's the end of everything. Uh, 
so they give all energy toward temporary aspects of our life. But where you know there's a continuity of consciousness, that you change the way you live. And what I told you before, you change the way what you eat, what you, how you handle other people, how you look to the environment, to look to, uh, to, to plants, to animals, to the planet Earth as well. So you changed a lot because death was not death, but another way of life. So, so they, they know mind and body are, are different and they know it for sure. It's nothing to believe, but it, it's knowing, it's an inner knowing that is totally different. And in our material based community, it's hard to find people who are open to listen. Although the younger generation is much better, it's more open than the older generation. So let me, um, that's an interesting point about the generations. The, um, do you find inadvertently yourself being so open to listen through your research? Um, there's a healing function that you've performed through documenting so much of this work? Well, let's say that um, I've met thousands of people that I did. I've received tens of thousands of emails from all over the world, people who share the ND with me because it's, they write me, nobody will listen and I'm happy to find someone who is open for it and they find my book uh, to help them to integrate the experience and to see that they're not crazy at all. So I think it's helpful for them to know there's the diagnosis of near-death experience and that you're not crazy at all. And that you can help other people as well with your new insight and what is important in life. It's a life insight experience as well. Yeah. I'm conscious that, you know, one of the very personal development -y things that I adhere to is that, you know, we are the average of the five people we spend most of our time with and just feeling into how much of your life you've dedicated to studying consciousness, people that have transitioned and come back and what their stories and their reports are. I'm fascinated to peer into how this has impacted your perspective on life and death because I think... um. Yeah, there's a there's a quote, um, something along the lines of you know, it's it's more like how you perceive death is really defines how you perceive life. Like some, I'm, I'm butchering yes. a quote. Our ideas but, about death define how we live our life. Of, of course, you know it. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, death, you know, this death is yeah. the end of everything. You then you have a different kind of life as well. Now, as a young doctor, young career, I was convinced that death was the end of everything. I was convinced that consciousness was a product of brain function. That's what I've learned in university or medical school. But because of my study of near death experience, because of meeting so many people with a near death experience, I've changed totally, and now I'm convinced that death is not the end. There's no beginning, nor will there ever be an end to consciousness. Consciousness is before birth and after death. There's a continuity of consciousness. And it's the, it, consciousness for me is fundamental in the universe as well. Everything comes from consciousness. All what we call matter is a product of consciousness as well, together with information and energy. So my total worldview has changed a lot in all those years. But it took a, lo a long time as well. <laughs> yeah wow and um yeah that's interesting because as you're talking about beyond time beyond space and the interconnectedness of things um it makes me wonder just what is possible because it sounds very quantum and it makes me wonder about the future of because quantum computing is starting to emerge in our world as we speak as well and just what may be possible to measure and analyze with the t future advancements in that space and the studies of the field that you've dedicated your research to. Have you contemplated um, what, some of this? Well, you cannot measure consciousness. It's, let's say our material science is based on what we can objectify, what we can measure, what we can duplicate, what we can falsify. And it is only true 
where we can objectify and measure, etc. Now, consciousness, what we feel, and what we think, we cannot objectify, we cannot measure, we cannot duplicate, we cannot falsify. This your consciousness is beyond the current materialist science. So uh, we have to change science as well. We have to expand science to include subjective experiences. So that's what we call post-materialist science as well. So we have to change the paradigm in science to include subjective experiences as true, as the essence, because what we are is what we think and what we feel. We are not our body. We have a body, but we are consciousness. So the essence of who we are, we cannot objectify with our current scientific, physical uh, uh, measurements and possibilities. So uh, that's the problem for a lot of neuroscientists and other people. They still are looking in the brain to find somewhere where consciousness is located, localized, but this, they will never find it because consciousness is not localized in the brain, it's not localized in the body, it's always everywhere. It makes me wonder about, you know when you have, um, there's stories you can find of people getting organ transplants or, you know, transplants of different body parts and, um, yeah, you know, there's some sort of personality traits or characteristics that carry over from the donor um, at times and it really, yeah, it just continues to open up yeah, the rabbit hole of where consciousness is really located. <laughs> That popular is it's with what they call transplanted memories. But we know from studies, and there's also a book, The Change of Heart, a famous book from the US, but also studies done in children who had a special heart or heart lung transplant, that they change aspects in a character based on the character of the donor. And only in the US, after five years, you can know who the donor was in the Netherlands and Europe, it's not possible. But when you understand that consciousness is outside and the body and brain and organs have just the interface function, and we have an, an, an organ transplantation, it means that you are transplanting living organs from a patient who has declared brain death but it is still in the process of dying so you don't have anything with a dead organ you need a living organ so when you receive a living organ from someone who was declared brain death you receive also the interface from aspect of the consciousness of the deceased donor so that will change things as well I, for me in each cell and the DNA in each cell as an interface function with aspects of this non-local consciousness. It's not in your body, but your body is related with it. Wow. Starting to make a lot of sense. <laughs> Starting to make a lot of sense. Now you asked you, the question, I asked you, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I love it. Thank you so much. You mentioned that, um, yeah, that we're in this... Well, there's an invitation in what you were sharing before for science to grow beyond material science into post-material science. And do you think that's something that's currently underway? Or do you think, yeah, what oh, is yes. the future of NDE research? Are we getting... I'm, I'm not only NDE research, I'm, I'm positive. Let's say Max Planck has said that you don't have to try to convince scientists for a new theory, but you have to wait until they die. Then a new generation will see it as totally normal. The quantum physics took another 80 years before it was generally accepted. And also the concept that consciousness is not local and the body is just, has just an interface function. It will take some time, but, uh, but as I've told you before, the younger generation is much more open. I lecture for medical students, for, for, for nurses, etc., in hospices. And the younger generation is much more open and understands the difference from the older but the problem also is that on schools and universities medical schools people still learn that consciousness is a product of brain function 
and there the curriculum is written by a different well. generation. Uh, so we have to wait a bit. And I, and I also know that uh, there are scientists and other uh, philosophers or psychologists are, are frightened if what they have told other people and learned to students that consists of product of brain function and they are wrong and their whole world view will collapse. It's hard for them to accept this new world for them. They can lose the position, they will lose their research money. And I know some professors who privately will tell me, you could be right. But officially they said this total nonsense until they retire. And then they say, yeah, well, it's different as I've told you before. So I, I can understand the reluctance from the, the scientists to be interested. They keep to their dogma because they are frightened. Yeah, it's interesting. I Reflecting on that Nikola Tesla quote, um, you know, he said the day that scientists start to approach non-physical phenomenon, you know, will make more progress in a decade than, you know, the generations that have come before us. I'm in, positive. Um, it will change. You know, yeah. <laughs> in terms of um, circling back to, yeah, yourself, I'm sure, you know, this has had an impact on yourself and your partner's life. Have you found yourself um, more compassionate in your ways um, through all the work that you've researched? And what's your relationship with death like? Are you afraid of death less so now yourself or are you is the, does that feel still present for you after everything you've exposed yourself to as I, as I told you before i changed a lot we are both vegetarian my wife and i for more than 25 years um, we love nature we're always out in nature for at least one hour our house is always silent no noise at all we have a huge garden we love to garden it um, and about my own death, I'm just curious. I'm not afraid, but I'm curious what will happen. This sounds very much like a motto for your life. <laughs> curious. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. And I guess it speaks somewhat to all this work to, yeah, that consciousness, what you've alluded to, and I'm sort of, connecting the dots now is that it's not something that dies it it does seem to be like mystically what's described before is eternal and i think that leaves a significant um conversation starting point i guess at least for how we treat yes each other but also the planet right because if it all of a sudden if because the way we behave is as if one and done, <laughs> you know, um, but when it's not one and done, um, that opens up a whole new potential way of looking at things and inviting us to treat things a different way, would you say? Yeah, your thoughts and insights on that? Well, what we know from people with the death experience that everything you do to others will come back to yourself, a positive and a negative aspect. When you give love to others, you will receive love. When you have hatred, of violence, you will feel violence back. So, the way we treat the planet now is destroying the planet, and that means we are destroying ourselves as well. So, we have to treat the planet better in order to survive as a species. So, we have to change a lot. We also, the way we, 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 we eat is uh, biological food always. Uh, on anthroposophic basis, so biological dynamic food. And so uh, you can change a lot. Um, and I think the only thing what you can change is yourself and your own consciousness. You cannot change others, but by changing yourself, you will help to change the world, and you help, will help to change others as well. But you can, I cannot change other people. I can just show how I live and talk about it. And the ripple effect carries out. Yeah. The um it does make me wonder because some of some some of some of humanity at the moment is conjecturing the end of humanity, touch wood, which, you know, really hope not. But 
who knows um any conjectures that you're in in terms of what happens to human consciousness does it just evolve into the next species of consciousness when the next species emerges is that or is it too far to conjecture into in your humble opinion i don't know about other species mm -hmm. i know that on this world on this planet everything and everybody has a kind of subjectivity a kind of consciousness so mm -hmm. not let's say the human consciousness is different from animal consciousness animal consciousness is more a group consciousness than an individual consciousness but also when you have a, a dog or a cat you know there's also an individual as well but there also plants have consciousness planet earth have a kind of subjectivity as well because everything comes from consciousness your body is formed by consciousness the planet earth is formed by consciousness the material universe is based on consciousness because consciousness is universal so everything is connected everything has a kind of subjectivity and this consciousness is eternal without beginning without end because it's fundamental it starts with consciousness the universe started with consciousness together with information and energy so what everything is... what we see what we perceive is based on consciousness as well back to what you were saying before again it, it poses such a dilemma for science though because science is always trying so hard to be so objective to um to keep the subjective at bay <laughs> at the best of its ability it, it seems is where we've been and so you do think a future is advancing um and you do think there is space for well must be space for the subjective to enter into the scientific formula it's happening already this so this the possibility of science as well the galilei commission as well there are a lot of scientists who are changing so i'm positive uh, and i think it's important as well because as i told you before if we want to survive on this planet we have to change our science as well we have to change the way we see we have to be aware that death is not the end there's a continuity of consciousness that we are connected and always we be connected also after death of our body so death is just a changing state of consciousness that's always consciousness fascinating can you share the story from the book about the guy that wakes up in the field and <laughs> and he ends up in um he ends up in the doctor's chair yeah but I don't. I didn't understand what you said. There was a gentleman in a. There's a story in your book where um, there's a particular individual, and he wakes up. Well, he's not waking up. Sorry, he gets found in. Sorry, that's probably why it didn't make sense. Okay. He's found in a field, <laughs> so he didn't I, wake I, up in the I field. He was I found in a field, it. and then he was. Like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it was even published in our in the Lancet article, and so also in my book. Uh, we found a patient. So there was a patient found in a meadow about thirty minutes. Uh, before he was brought into a hospital and so passers by found him and started to some simple CPR was brought by ambulance to the coronary care where uh, he came in he was cold because it was already blue and he was unconscious there was no body reflexes no brain stem reflexes no heart rhythm nothing at all he was like that and the nurse started to intubate the patient to give him more oxygen. And they found out that he had dentists in the mouth. So they took out the upper dentist and put them somewhere on the cash card. And they continued for about one and a half hour CPR before he had blood pressure and heart rhythm again. But he was still in coma. He still was on artificial respiration. So they transferred him to, him to the intensive care unit where he was for one week in coma when he regained consciousness he was brought back to the cardiac ward and he was just there when the nurse came in for medication and he saw the nurse and he said you know where my dentists are and he told the nurse that when he came into hospital that the nurse had taken out his dentures and put it on a sliding something on a car with all those bottles on it and he could describe the, res the small resuscitation room from a position above his own body and he was remember he was brought in coma into this recitation coma he was left his room in coma but he could describe it in too detail he could describe 
And there's some doctors who were ba was busy with his CPR. So the nurse was flabbergasted. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> what was her reaction like? <laughs> <laughs> and I have people also, this is a kind of objective proof for the out of body experience. So you can, this is corroboration of theoretical aspects. And I have been a book recently come out with a second print now with 128 cases of corroborated cases of theoretical perception. And they found that um, about 98% of what people told during CPR, cardiac arrest, during coma, during general anesthesia, was totally correct. What they have perceived was exactly what happened during the CPR or surgery or coma. So it proves that consciousness can be experienced beyond the brain and when the body and brain does not function anymore. How come we don't hear so much about these stories? Like, you've obviously dedicated so much of your life's work to it and you and I are doing a podcast on it, we're having the conversation, they're slowly coming out, but it does feel like the trap is the, the tap is only trickling. Um, whereas these stories are truly fascinating and these insights, they're happening repeatedly around the world. Why is the information not as widely accepted, adopted, spreading? What like what's going on? <laughs> do you have yeah, do you have that sense? Well, the problem is that people are not able to share their experiences with others. It's not accepted in our materialist-based community. Uh, and there are many more experiences of enhanced consciousness. Let's say the end-of-life experience, that people, when they die, then they see their deceased parents or partner coming to get them, and they see a light of visual landscape. And there now have been studies done that about 90% of people in the dying process of dying have this kind of end-of-life experiences. So they are already partly out of the body as well. And you have also the after-death communication. Then you have contact with the consciousness of deceased relatives in the first days, weeks, or months uh, after they died. And there's some sort of objects of communication as well, but you can see them, you can feel them, you can smell them. And, and this usually happens, this kind of experience during dream, and, and then they tell you, I had a dream about him or her who died. But uh, we know now for sure that in Europe, 125 million people had these kind of experiences. And they just recent Pew Review in the US found that 175 million people have this kind of after-death communication. But the problem is they don't talk about it or they say I just had a dream. But when it is possible to be in contact with the consciousness of the deceased relative, then you know now for sure that consciousness will never disappear. Consciousness will always be there. So it's also a life-changing event as well. But they're also reluctant to talk about it. And they also th think to themselves, it's just a dream. But it's not a dream. It's a conscious experience during sleep. Because during sleep, the threshold is lower to receive this information. And deceased relatives are able to contact you because you're asleep. So uh, it's so normal. Uh, people, when I give a lecture, I always ask at the start of the discussion about how many people know someone with an ND or someone had an ND. And then the next question is, how many of you have the, ever had the inner feeling of inner knowing to be in contact with the deceased relatives? About 50% of the people who I did. So they don't talk about it, but they have these kind of experiences. So it happens so often. And as soon as people are more willing to share their experiences, also the death of it, the change will come. And I, I'm sure that the change of insight about the non-locality of consciousness comes from the general population and not from science. Yeah, yeah I um, was reflecting as you were sharing. I um, had a, a one of my best friends, actually, her, um, her mother and father passed away very close to each other in, in time. Um, 
and in be- before her mother uh, sorry after her mother passed away her grandmother who was overseas was also passing away some months later and she hadn't no one had told her because she was so old and you know in quite a frail fragile state that her daughter had passed because they didn't know how to break the news to her and um subsequently what happened was when it was time for the grandmother to pass she was she spoke to all of her children that were living and said oh my daughter's actually passed away and no one had told her and she and they said how do you know she's like oh her and my brother have come to get me that's what i told you that's the end of life experience of deathbed vision and it's it's so normal that it happens but usually they're not recognized as well also not in palliative care or hospices they think it's a hallucination or just side effect of medication of of, of terminal uh, hallucination etc but it is so real what they see and it change they lose the fear of death just before the eye because they see their deceased relatives and i'm reflecting on what my mind did with that piece of information was oh yeah there's always interesting stuff that happens to people at the end of their life and then just compartmentalized it and put it away <laughs> and never really sat to reflect and unpack it much further until I've joined this conversation with you. It's interesting. It's almost like the mind has an aversion to look at this stuff because at the risk of it seeming crazy. Mm. But like you said, things are changing. Things are changing. In our, again, in our materialist si- uh, community, it's not possible to have this kind of experience because consciousness disappears when you die and this kind of experiences prove that consciousness is eternal and it will never end it's always there and we have we may have contact with this consciousness as well so it's against what we learn on university medical school it's what we learn on this current materialist community as well but again the younger generation is open so I'm positive. Yeah. <laughs> and how's how's that been for you? Per, uh, I want to say personally, but personally, professionally, because you like you, like we started the podcast. <laughs> You've been doing this longer than I've been around. <laughs> <Don't you That's laughs> right. And so I'm sure if people are slowly opening up to it now, when you started, <laughs> how did people receive you then, and how has the receiving of this work that you've been exploring evolved over time like yeah bring us with you on the journey a lot of people were not interested at all or this didn't ask about it and um, were not open for it as well also doing now our, our, our prospective study and patients with a five cardiac arrest also in the hospital a lot of doctors were not interested um, but it did not matter for me because I was so let's say following my heart and following what I wanted to do that it didn't matter at all what other people thought so it's not important when you have a, a, let's say a mission to fulfill to finish these kind of studies it's not important what other people think. And when you get critical comments, I always say it's that you learn how people think, but doesn't say anything about your own uh, activity as well. It's just about other people, not about me. It's profound. After having studied this for so long, received so many lessons from so many people, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure having your consciousness <laughs> shaken up and stirred and <laughs> woken up in so many different ways through it all. <laughs> what is um? What would you say are some of the biggest insights or lessons that you've learned from this whole thing? Yeah. The biggest insight is that the essence of who we are will never end. 
death is not the end of who we are. We are always connected with other people, oak, may we have died. And when we leave our body, we come into a dimension where it's all about unconditional love and compassion. That's what I've learned. And is that the advice for the living as well, to live with more compassion and more love? Yes, we should try to do it. Incredible. Wow. <laughs> Again. And I always say, start, yeah. start to have compassion and empathy towards yourself mm. and accept your negative aspects we all have. So start with yourself and then have compassion and empathy towards others as well. Mm. Beautiful. For those that are curious to explore more around this work, I will put a link um, to your book and the articles um, in the show notes below. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share sure with the audience? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. So there'll be a link to that in the show notes below, guys, for you guys to go check out um, and grab a copy. It's a very interesting read um, and some incredible stories as well for you to really go into. And, and, and also yeah. on my website, there are a lot of interviews in English as well. So my website, www.pimvalamal.nl or www.consciousnessbeyondlife.com. You can find a lot of stories, scientific articles, um, interview documentaries etc awesome I'll much more than what we could share now in this show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for sharing yourself here with us it is such an incredible insight um into yeah life the nature of consciousness the nature of our mind and contemplating death and what's after and where we were before we came here and also you know what it really means to live you know contemplating the relationship with the nature of our consciousness and the essence of what makes us up is truly such a profound contemplation. And, you know, it, every time I think we go along the exercise, we're changed for it just a little bit for the better every time. So I want to thank you for today's conversation, but it seems, um, yeah, this is just a, a grain of sand compared to the beach. Obviously this conversation lands on the shoulders of, all the thousands of hours of research and the years and years of research you've put into this space and, you know, integrated so many of the lessons into your life and the books that you've written and the articles. And man, I want to thank you for the conversation. Of course I have to do that, but thank you for you and, you know, showing up and, you know, even when, you know, it wasn't collectively people as cu much curious about it, you know, you've you just pioneered such an incredible space for your own curiosity and uh yeah we really get to have such a rich conversation today because of it so thank you for you yeah really appreciate it Pim. thank you you're welcome you're welcome Yo! thank you so much for watching this video all the way to its end obviously you absolutely love this podcast and i want to thank you so much for watching this all the way through here is another video that's perfectly curated just for you to watch as the next best video to keep your inspiration flowing, to keep you evolving, to keep you yelling. Check it out now.